Lord, that is the key word. Awe. You are so awesome. You've worked things out that we couldn't even possibly imagine. That there was no way you could bring peace out of this situation. That there was no way that this thing could be restored. Or this thing could full, come full circle. Or you could heal this or you could do that, Lord. We stand in awe of you. Because we've seen what you've done in our life. We know what we read in this word. And we believe it. And we trust in it. We read your promises. And we know that you're a faithful God. So Lord, we do stand in awe of you. We stand in awe that you would leave heaven, come to this earth, empty yourself, take on the form of a man, a servant, and die for the very man you created that rejected you. We stand in awe of that. Lord, speak to us tonight. Those that may have came in with a heavy burden with a tough day. Let it all go out the door. And let us focus on you. So Lord, we thank you that we're able to even be here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, y'all. Let's go to Psalm 80 something. I can't see. <laughs> 89. There we go. 89. Are you glad to be at church? <laughs> Psalm 89. Let's go. There's an excitement, there's an anticipation. That we should have when we open up God's word. Do you agree with that? Amen. I hope you have that right now. Psalm 89. We'll be there in just a minute. So we've been talking about things that distract us. Things that keep us from purpose. Things that take, away, take us away from Jesus. Things that take us away from Jesus things, like prayer, like his word, like worship, like us representing Jesus wherever we go, like us spending quality time with our family. What is that distraction that's keeping us from being who God has called us to be? What is that? You know, all distractions that come our way have one source, and we know who that is. That source is the devil. But the difference is now, nowadays, he has a whole lot more to work with than just a snake in the garden, right? And we need to realize whatever he offers us is a lie. It will never fill us. It will never complete us. It will never quench our thirst like Jesus will. Amen? Anything he has to offer, it's a lie. And it's a distraction. And it will leave you feeling robbed. Have you ever, like, when you did something you know you shouldn't have done and you took that offer from the devil, did you ever walk away and you're like, man, I feel robbed. I feel, I feel empty, I feel alone, I feel confused, I feel gut shot. I love saying that even though none of us have probably ever been gut shot. But we can imagine what it feels like. That's the way I know I feel. One of his biggest lies, and then I want to continue on this today. One of his biggest lies and biggest distractions, distractions is when he can tell me and you that we can be our own God. 
And this is big today, church, because most everybody thinks that they are their own God. Seriously. In other words, okay, uh, you define what, what you think is right and what you think is wrong. You define what makes you know what what, what makes you happy at all costs. Doesn't matter what is going to hurt somebody else. You define what's right, and we know what the scripture says: what seems right to a man leads to death. So this can't be right. We have to have a standard. We have to have a standard. You know, I was talking to Jerry before church. He, he's, a, he's a construction worker, and he has to build stuff that's going to fit in certain places. What if he eyeballed everything? You know what I'm saying? What if, what if he eyeballed and said, yeah. Now, people that's done it a long time making eyeball things and get it pretty close. But if you want it to be true, what do you got to do? You got to put a tape measure on it or a level. This word is exactly that. We have to have a standard that we live by, and we know it's this Word of God. You can't, we can't say, hey, this seems right, or this is right, and this is wrong. And somebody else says, no, nah, I don't think that's right, and I think this is wrong. And then, you, then, then boom, 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 you go back and forth. Okay, where do we go to find out the truth? We go where? To the Word of God. But this lie, this lie that Satan uses to, to tell us that we can be our own God means this, that, that you and I become our own, what, distraction. We become, have, you, have you become your own distraction away from Jesus? I know I have probably plenty of times. I've distracted myself because I'm selfish away from Jesus and his types of things. It's exactly what he did with Eve, and don't you know he's doing it with us? What did he say to her? We'll look at it on the screen in Genesis 3, verse 5. He said, hey, girl, God knows the moment that you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be open, right? And it says that you will be like God. You will know good and evil, and you'll be like God. Don't you know that pulled at her heartstrings and at her pride strings? I mean, yeah. You, oh, oh, are you serious, Mr. Snake? That I now can say what's right and what's wrong? Like I could eat of all the trees and this one right here? You mean there's no boundaries? That's right. He's holding out on you. That, that God that walks with you, he's holding out on you. He's a liar. He's actually the enemy. He says, I'm the one telling you the truth. And what did she do? She bought into that lie. And how many times do we do the same thing? Because listen to me, this is good. This is a great note if you're taking notes. Whoever or whatever is crowned God in your life will be what is worshipped in your life. Did you hear that? That, that whatever's crowned God in your life, crown number one, that's going to be what, what we worship. And that's going to be what image we take on as well. So if self, if we worship self, if, if, if God is, if our God is us, then that means we worship us. That means we take on the image of us, right? But let me give you a heads up. We make a very, very, very bad God. Because sin makes a bad God, and us trying to be God is a very, very bad God. Think about it for a minute. We're limited in our resources. We're limited in our answers. Oh, you can Google it now and ask Siri. Yeah. But we're still limited in knowledge. We're still limited in wisdom. Siri doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? We're limited in time. We're limited in strength. We're limited because of this flesh. God is not limited. I want you to think about this for a minute. We're limited just simply because we got to go to sleep. God says, God says, I never sleep or slumber. While we're asleep, somebody can sneak up on us. You can't sneak up on God. We're limited. We make a bad God. Psalm 89. Let's look at it in verse 6. I love this. For who, it's just a question, who in heaven can be compared to the Lord? I mean, we, we hadn't been there yet, but 
We could probably scan around and... No, there's nobody like him. Okay, then, well, who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? In other words, he's looking on earth now, says, all you kings, all you presidents, all you big dogs, all you money men, all you money ladies, what, all you that can do awesome things, let me check y'all out. Are y'all like the Lord? No. So you can write in your Bible right there and say, nobody. Because he goes on to say that God is greatly to be what? Feared, in other words, respected. Where? In the church house and assembly of the saints. And to be held in reverence, in awe. Remember that word, awesome? Okay. By all those around him. In other words, there's not a place you're not standing on his robe. So we're all around him because he's around everybody. Right? So who should, who should revere him? Everybody. Right? That's the call. Everybody. Okay? So these letters, M-O, they stand for method of operation. Okay? It's a, a method of operation is a pattern. And when you look through the scripture and you see the pattern of the way Satan has done things throughout the scripture, then you'll understand that the devil's M.O., his method of operation, is to redirect worship off of God. And honestly, church, I don't think he even cares as long as the worship is not on him. That's why the devil doesn't bother you when you worship your vehicle, worship your house, worship some person, or even worship yourself. Because as long as the worship is not on God, then he's good. You don't get devil conviction. <laughs> no. You get conviction when the worship is taken off of God. He, The devil wants to... To take, take it off of God and put it somewhere else. He would rather put it on us. Because he knows that that won't run dry. The car is going to wear out. That house is going to wear out. You won't go want something bigger and better. But you always, 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 even wanting those things, you're still worshiping yourself. Is this making sense to anybody? Okay. But he wants to redirect worship. Remember, let's look at it on the screen. Isaiah 14. This is, this is uh, Lucifer. Uh, who was Satan when he was an angel, but he got kicked out of heaven. Why? Well, here we go. How fallen, fallen. Say fallen. He's fallen from heaven, right? Oh, Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down. So we see that he's fallen and he's cut down the one who weakened the nations. Okay? Keep reading. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregations on the farther side of the north. Verse 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And watch this. He says, I will be like the most high. But watch what happens in the next verse. Yet you should be brought down. We've seen where he's fallen. He's been kicked out. He's brought down to the pit. He's brought down to hell. Okay? He's been kicked out of heaven. Why? Because he says, I will ascend above the most high. You look that word up, most high, in the Hebrew, and it means God's name of El Elyon. You ever heard that? El Elyon means God most high. When you, when you look at the most high, he is the highest thing there is. He has complete authority over every single thing. And the devil thinks he could handle that. He says he thinks he could, he could be like the most high. That's not possible. Okay? But that's what he was in his heart. Okay? What do we call that? When you want to be like somebody or better than somebody... Yeah, that's pride and arrogance. Okay? So his pride and arrogance is what got his butt kicked out of heaven. Okay? So, when me and you fall into the offer or the trap of pride and arrogance, 
Who are we looking most like? The devil. Okay? The devil. That's exactly right. We're definitely not being like the most high. Okay? We're being like the devil. Now, let me give you an example of this. I'm headed somewhere. Let's go to Philippians 2. I say that all the time. I'm actually, I actually am headed somewhere every time. So, <laughs> but go to Philippians 2. We're going to start looking at this in verse 5. I don't want us to fall for this trap of pride and arrogance to think that we're somebody. The, the, the word says we're nothing without Jesus. Absolutely nothing. He's the vine. We just the old branch off the vine. All glory should go to him. Any accolade that you receive, you should point the glory to Jesus. Right? Anything that goes well with you, point to Jesus. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute, when things don't go well with you, we need to point it to Jesus. Because he does say he works all things, right? Even though it's looking bad, he will work the thing for good. But we'll get to that here in just a minute. But watch this. Okay, what kind of mind should we have? And I'm going to give you an example. Okay, Philippians 2, and we'll start in verse 5. Notice how it starts off. Let this mind, this mindset, right, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What, what did we learn? Who Christ, the anointed one, or the anointing of Jesus, right? Okay, listen. Watch this. Watch this. We're supposed to have this mind, right? Think of Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, right? He was in the form of God. Because why? He is God. Everything about him is God. His, 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 his outer appearance in heaven is God. His, his, in, in, his heart, is he's God. All about him is, is God. He's most high, right? Okay. So he is most high. Okay. So when he came to this earth, he said it did not, he did not consider it robbery that he is equal to God because he is God. Okay, but watch this. But he made himself, or other translations say he emptied himself. He made himself, he emptied himself to have no reputation. Oh my goodness. Can you swallow that for a minute? The king of kings and the lord of lords just emptied himself of any kind of reputation. I'm nothing now. I'm going to step to this earth. I'm going to put on human flesh. What? What? He had to do that, church. If he would have come with one dust particle from heaven, it would have probably killed every one of us. Does that make sense? He had to empty himself of everything. Everything. So what did he do, though? He came and took on the form of a servant or a bond servant. What does that mean? That means he came to serve us in the highest possible way because he was going to take our sin, our shame, that's ours, and die for it. That is the greatest servitude you'll ever see in your entire life. It says there's no greater love than this that a man would lay his life down for a friend. So that's, that's the greatest servant you would ever see. He took on the form of that servant, a bond servant. Okay? Now, you ready for this? And come in the likeness of a man. Now, okay, we started this by saying we should have the same mind frame that, that, that Jesus, as Jesus, okay? We see him empty himself, of himself, okay? Uh, and then now he becomes like a man. In other words, the, in the fashion of a man. That word likeness actually means fashion, okay? <laughs> okay, think about it. You, there's a difference between fashion and form. You can put a wig on and lipstick, and, and, but you still are not, have not changed who you are, your form. Okay, you can say you're one thing or say you're another thing. None of that matters. When your bones have been laying in the grave for years, they can still check your DNA and tell if you're male or female. I'm serious. You can't change who you, your form, who God made you to be. You can dress it up and say you're this and say you're that and change this and change, but you cannot. You can change your fashion, but you can't change your form. The way God formed you, your spirit, who you are, 
and your gender is still in your bones. <laughs> I didn't know we were going there. But there's a difference between fashion and form. Okay? But he took on the fashion of a man. We know this because he walked this earth. Church, he had to wrap himself in an earth suit. He had to wrap himself in the fashion of a man. Again, or I think everybody would have died. Because we can't handle holiness. Right? Okay. So he found himself, verse 8, in the appearance of a man. And watch this. He humbled. Somebody say that with me. He humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of going to the restaurant that you didn't want to eat at. No. To the point of death. Just dying is one thing. But when they said to death on a cross, he he humbled himself to, to the death on a cross. You just went, you just blowed the mind of everybody in that day. Because you know. The whipping post. Then you carry your cross. Then they put you. They they nail you to it. They, it, it, they what, what was it? Was it Jim Caviezel that played the, in the, in the Passion of Christ as he was on the cross that you couldn't see it, but he was sitting on a bicycle seat just to take the pressure off of him. And he said he still liked to die because it, the pressure of hanging on a cross and he wasn't even nailed to the thing. You see what I'm saying? He said just being up there hanging like that. He said it, it, it was horrible. And he was sitting on a bicycle seat. But what I'm saying is Jesus knew the pain that was coming to him. That's why he was in the garden sweating drops of blood. He humbled himself to do that. Why? For the greater good of the situation. What was the greater good, church? Us. Yes. Okay. Therefore, what, what do you do when you see a therefore? You go back and look at why it's therefore. Right? Okay. So therefore, all that, we just said he humbled himself. He came to this earth. He humbled himself to die on a cross for us. Then God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Let's go. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and of those in heaven and on earth and all those under the earth. And at, the, at, at that, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Okay. I started, and I use this example to say this. Okay. Jesus' mind frame was to humble himself in the most incredible possible way that you could ever do. First of all, by leaving heaven. Wrapping himself in flesh, allowing himself to be ridiculed, arrested, spit on, crown of thorns, the whole nine yards, made the king of kings carry his own cross, and then crucifying him on that cross. That's probably the most humbling thing that you would ever see. And Jesus just said, let that mind be in us, didn't he? Okay, so think about it. Jesus humbled himself, and then he was what? Exalted. Right? You with me? Don't miss this. Satan exalted himself and got his tail humbled, kicked out of heaven. Are you following me? Okay, so here I would say we need to learn from Jesus and learn how to put self on the back burner so self would not ever be a distraction in our life. Humble ourselves to the point that we should consider others more than ourselves. Oh, this ain't easy. This is in our kitchen and even cooking in our kitchen. That's humility, church. But wait a minute. It ain't like, well, I'm just going to take one for the team. <sighs> and whine and complain about it. To me, if you're going to whine and complain about it, you might as well put yourself first. No. Humble yourself. And what's the promise? You will be. Mm -hmm. 
There's not a humble person. If you want to be, if you want to be somebody, humble yourself. Come on, somebody. Huh? But see, you're going to be somebody for Jesus and not somebody for somebody. Mainly you. Amen. John 12, verse 32. You ever, you ever read this verse that he said, If I be lifted up, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I'm the one that will draw men unto me. Obviously, he's talking about the cross, but listen to me. If we, church, this is the best thing I can tell you today. If we lift Jesus up, he's the one. He's the one that can lead people to salvation. We can't lift us up because we're nobody. If, okay, if we lift ourselves up and people come to us, we can't save them. Okay? They have to go to Jesus. They have to go to Jesus. This is our life assignment. Jesus is the number one focal point in our life, bar none. That's why I drove, when we, last time I went to Dallas, every time I go to Dallas, I see. Oh, Reverend so and so, and, and uh, Bishop so and so, pictures of Bishop, Mom and Daddy here at, at, at Sanctified Baptist Church, West Dallas, or whatever. Okay, they got the pictures up there, just cheesing, right? Think about that. Are they, are they saying, hey, have y'all seen our billboard yet? Have you seen me and my husband up there? You seen my husband on the billboard? No. Have you seen the billboard? That's about Jesus, not about you. Seriously. All they're wanting to do is somebody they went to high school uh, with to drive by and say, I be dog. There's big nasty John up there as, as Reverend Bishop John now up there. Well, I be dog. Well, good for him. That's your, that's your exaltation. That's your reward right there. No, I'm going to tell you what. I wish one of y'all would go find out how much a billboard is. And I'm talking about ministry now. I'm not talking about because one of our church members is on a billboard because she's trying to sell houses. She ain't trying to sell her. She's trying to sell houses, okay? I'm talking about ministry, all right? Ministry. You don't put yourself up there on your ministry board. You put Jesus up there. I wish we'd find out how much one is, and we could say, we could put one up there that says, it's all about Jesus, Jesus all the time. And if you want to hear about Jesus, then www.friendship, whatever it is, dot whatever. Okay? Come, come, come see. Let us encourage you about who? Jesus. Don't come see the pastor. Don't, don't come see anybody else. Okay? Come see and hear about Jesus. Is this making sense? I hope I ain't offending nobody. You may be on a billboard in Dallas. I don't even know. I hope it ain't about ministry, though, or about one of the nightclubs. So <laughs> let's, go <to> <coughs> let's go to Matthew 16. Oh, Lord. We can tell who's been in the club just by watching you worship. Got to reel it in. Got to reel it in. Sway in your hips. Okay, look at here. Matthew 16. That's the inside joke, by the way. Ask, ask Amanda and Danielle. Yeah, ask Danielle and Amanda. Okay, watch this. Let's go deeper. Can we go a little deeper? This is Wednesday night crew. Amen. Look at verse 21. Oh, y'all got to hear me on this. Not me, but hear the Lord. But listen. Okay, here we go. Let's just, just jump in. Everybody there, Matthew, what did I tell you? 16. Okay, verse 21. All right. So, so from that time, Jesus began to, to, to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Okay. Suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed And raised on the third day. Hey, everything ends in victory, right? But don't you know they, they were hung up on, you're going to be suffering and you're going to be killed. Okay, he's talking to his disciples, right? So Peter, here he is. He takes Jesus aside 
and begin to scold him, begin to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. He was being respectful. This, not, this shall not happen to you. In other words, I have a sword and they have ears. Right? I mean, sir, you, you got to think about what he's saying. And, and I think we would do the same thing. Like, no, Jesus, they are not coming in here to get you. Okay, he understands. Jesus understands his fire. Okay? But here's what I want to show you. Watch verse 23. So he turns to Peter, okay, and he says, talking to Satan, get behind me, Satan. Peter's not Satan, obviously, but he's being a mouthpiece for Satan because if he's going to defend Jesus and keep him from going to the cross, he's stopping this massive plan to save our soul, right? We know this because we're on the other side of the cross. So if we would have been there that day, we prob- if we knew what we knew today, we wouldn't have said that. We would have said, yeah, that's right, Jesus, and thank you. Right? Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Going to do that for us. But no, Peter's like, I got you, Lord. I got you, Lord. I got my sword. They got ears. And we're finna get, we're finna get nasty. No, no, Jesus said, hey, you need to get behind me, Satan. Watch this. You are an offense to me. In other words, you're trying to stop me from going to the cross. Okay? Watch this. Please, you may have never seen this. But you can't miss it now because we're fixing to expose it. He's talking to Satan, right? He says, for you are not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. Okay. That word mindful, check this out. If you write in your Bible, put it in there. That, that word mindful means to savor. Like, put a piece of chicken in your mouth that's good. You just dipped it in the gravy. And you're like, mmm. Oh, that's good. And then you look and you got five more pieces left. Mmm. Or... You know, I'm trying to think of what, what you might savor, okay? Put, have that picture, okay? That's what mindful means. Okay, let's just do it like this. Mindful means savor. It means to, your mouth is watering over it. It's all you think of, or it's what excites you. Okay, read it like that. He says, okay, devil, you're not, you're not mindful... You're, 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 you're savoring the things of man. Sin. You're savoring the things of sin. Your mouth is watering because of the things of sin. You're excited because of sin. Not the things of God. Does that make sense? Where's your thought? What excites you? Okay, so I, I, let's ask ourselves that question. What really makes your mouth water? And I'm talking about your spiritual that mouth or your f- sin nature mouth. Okay, let's just say it like that. What excites you? I mean, were you so excited that it was Wednesday today? Huh? You ready? You ready? Oh, man, we're going to go worship tonight. We're going to go ahead and get that word. Are you excited when it comes Sunday? You know, are you excited that you have, you know, maybe a 30-minute drive to work where you can turn on some worship music and be ready so you don't have to bite somebody's head off when you get to work? Lord, get me, put me in my place. Put me in my place. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Right? Okay, I'm good. Keys out the car. Right? Here we go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Do, do, you, do, you, do you savor that or is it something else? Maybe you just can't wait to get off work because you're going to dive into something we shouldn't be diving into. You see what I'm saying? Okay, watch what Jesus says. So then Jesus says to the disciples, if you, 
if, if anyone desires to, to, to savor the things of God, in other words, to come after me, come after Jesus, right? What does he say? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, what, would it, what does he say? You'll find it. Okay. Have you ever been confused with that, that saying, take up your cross? Okay. Because a lot of people, I've heard of people, well, it's just the burden I got to bear. You know, the Lord wants me to take up the cross. No, he's the bearer of burdens, not you. Okay. To take up your cross and follow him simply means this, that it's, it's a self-sacrifice. In other words, there's some things that we need to put on the back burners to, so we can follow Jesus. Huh? Oh, yeah. There's some things that we need. Yeah, because, you know, our want to, our flesh nature wants to do that. But for the sake of Jesus, we deny ourselves and we follow him. Yeah. That's it. That's it right there. That's that's. That's so good. Because if you, if you, if you cater to self, to self, then you're glorifying yourself. Okay, let's go, to one, let's go to another one. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, so go to your right. Y'all getting anything out of this? We are our biggest distraction we got a few more weeks in this, and then we'll move on to another, another something, a little something, something. But we gotta, we got to get, we gotta get this first. This is, this is so important. This whole, this is, this is number 11, man. This, is, this has been so good, so important. Okay, let me show you this. Um, for time's sake, I'm going to skip to verse 7. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. All right, let me just set this up and say that This is the Apostle Paul talking, and he's been literally, you go back and read it, the Lord, he don't even, Paul don't even know if he was a vision or if it was real or whatever it was. He just knows it was of God, and it was awesome. And it would be one of these things like, he could really, really, really boast about it, and he could get the big head about it. Y'all need to hear me. Get the big head about it. Get swole up about it. Because he got to do that. And he made, Jesus made him, took him to heaven and showed him so all this. Cause we don't even know. All we can do is speculate. But he said he could come back and say, ah. Right? Look what I did. Look what I did. He could, he could come back in, in, in church. It was pretty serious. And he could probably really, really, really. He may even. he Listen. He may even saw his name on one of them foundations in the city of God. You never know. So he could really come and say, say, ah, my name's up there in heaven. You know, or whatever. He could have got a glimpse into the future, and he could really, 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 really boast about it. We don't know, though. All we can do is speculate. Okay? So think, he he has that knowledge. So pick it up in verse 7. You ready? He's so, he's so smart about this. He, he has the mind of God. He goes, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation. Now, just stop right there. Think about it. He said, unless, I, how does he say it? Unless I'm exalted, watch this, above measure. Like, you can't even measure what I want to tell you. Okay, what is above measure? It means like, if you got a gallon jug, okay, and you're trying to put two gallons in it, when you get past that first gallon, what's going to happen? Everything else is wasteful. So he's saying, what I could say right now is I could boast above and beyond. Like, you would just be like blown mind and just be ah, swimming in it, right? Because of what? Because of what he got to experience in the Lord, Okay. Now, don't, don't miss that. In other words, how, what does this mean to us today? There's some things that go our way that we could get the big head. I'm serious. There's some things that, that, that could go right that's a blessing or, or, or for the Lord. Everything just works out. And, man, our head could swell. 
And when our head swells, we think we're better than others. Huh? Tell the truth. Okay? But I want you to think about it. Above measure means wasteful. When you get to big head, there's a lot of waste. Because the waste comes when the glory should be going to God and not your big head. How about the one that gave you and blessed you? And you, we're walking around like a strutting turkey. Right? Look at me. Look at me. Uh-huh. Only you know how that fits to you. But watch what God did. And, and, and remember what I said. I, you know, anything good that happens is, is of God in our life. And I'm going to argue and say there's a lot of bad that can happen that we bring on ourselves. But there's hardship that we go through that is of God too. Okay? Where do I get that? The very next statement. Let's read it. Lest I should be exalted and had a big head above, above uh, measure because of what I saw. It says a thorn in the flesh. Anybody ever had one of them? Not a sticker, but a thorn was given to me. It's a gift from God, a thorn in the flesh. He calls it a messenger of Satan to buffet, to beat him. Him to remind him of stuff, lest I be exalted above measure. Okay, time out. That doesn't sound like a gift to me. Okay? But he said it was given to him by God, a thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was. We just know it's a messenger of Satan. Something that kept him humble. Something... That the, that the devil would remind him of, would, would humble him and keep him humble. And it possibly, he was so tormented with his past because of what he used to do. And God allowed that to be on the forefront of a mind, or his mind where he used to drag Christians out because he hated Christians, because he hated Jesus, even though he didn't know Jesus. But now he loves Jesus. Jesus has changed his life. That could be it. All we know, it was a thorn in the flesh that reminded him and kept him humble. Now, think about that for a minute, okay? God's gift to Paul was hardship. <laughs> that was his gift, okay? But without that gift of hardship and the thorn, Paul would have done what? You, are you staying with me on this? He would have exalted himself. Okay, all right. So then that means the thorn kept him from being prideful and arrogant and having a big head. So if there is some issue, is if, there's, if there's something going on in your life but it keeps you humble, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's hard to swallow. Ooh. Okay, so when we face something that's beyond us, a hardship, listen, it could be a divine setup. Right? It could be a divine setup. In other words, okay, follow me in this, because if we could have done it ourselves, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Okay, do you hear me? If we've got something going on in our life that's beyond us, then that means we can't do it. Right? That means we need Jesus. Right? Okay. Because if we would have done it, our pride and arrogance would have raised up another level. Look what I did. I got us out of that, baby girl. Look to your man when you need something. Right? I got us out. I figured it out. I figured it out. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Jesus. Jesus figures it out. Okay? Listen. Listen. Listen, church, if you wouldn't have needed Jesus, if you could have done it yourself, then you would have never seen him like you've seen him before. Now you see him now. I'm serious. So hardship, what hardship is, you don't miss this. Hardship is an invitation to get to know him better. 
than you ever would before. And ultimately, what does it do? It keeps us humble. Because you get in a situation and your head shrinks because I couldn't have done it without you, God. And that makes him bigger, better, stronger, greater. And us, little, lesser, weaker. You know, you know what I mean. So, but in him, we are bigger, better, stronger, greater because of him. But us, we're lesser, we're weaker. Is this making sense? Okay, verse 8. Concerning this thing, Paul didn't want this thorn. He cried out, how many? Three times that it made, Lord, get this off of me. But then when he realized what it was doing, and Jesus' only answer was this, I got it tattooed right here on my arm. I got to remind myself. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, you could be, listen, church, if, as long as we have his grace, that's all we need. Huh? As long as we have the grace of God, that's really all we need. But he then goes on to say, he says, hey, Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, here's what Paul said, I'm going to start boasting in my hardship, in my infirmity. That way the power of Jesus may rest up on me. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to boast in the tough days because God is seen way more when I'm weak than when I think I'm strong and I can handle things. We say it all the time as it comes off of a song, easy, easy never needed Jesus. If it's easy all the time and you can handle it, you, you're never going to look to him. So Paul is saying, I need to be weak. I need to not be able to do it so I can just see how strong my God is. So verse 10 says, therefore, I'm going to take pleasure in infirmity, reproach, needs, persecution, distress, for Jesus' sake. Because when I'm weak, baby, he is strong, makes me strong. Isn't that what he said? For when I'm weak, then I am what? Strong. Let's go. That's good. That's so good. Go, go, go let that soak in right there in your Bible study this week. Let God speak to you right there. We've got time for one more. Yeah, let's look at this one real quick and we're done. Acts 28. Go back to your left. And we'll be done. Acts 28. I got to show you this because this is Paul. Some of you may have not even seen this. You talk about bad days. So notice this. Acts 28. We're going to do verse 1 through 6. We'll be done. Here's the deal. Paul and them was headed to Rome. He always wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to preach Jesus in Rome, right? But they got shipwrecked. Now, you think about it. If you went, now, we're not talking about out on Lake of the Pines, nothing like that. Not over at Gladewater, nothing like that, right? We're talking about the man's in a ship, all right? And they they hit a they hit they hit like Titanic did they hit they hit some rocks or they hit icebergs or whatever right probably wasn't icebergs rocks okay busted the ship up now they're floating on pieces of wood that's not a good day okay so this is where we pick it up it says verse one says when they had escaped they found out that the island they went up on an island called Malta. And the natives that were living on this island showed us unusual kindness. In other words, hey guys, <laughs> y'all look y'all y'all look pretty rough. Let us build you a fire. Thank you, right? Because I imagine all the wood they had was wet, and if they had anyway some flint or anything, all that was wet. All right. They showed us kindness. They kindled a fire. They made us all welcome. Probably gave them a little something to eat. 
Because of the rain that was falling and because of the what? Cold. There's no telling how this felt, y'all. When's the last time you fell out the boat? I bet you got right back in. Okay. Now watch. You would say that's a bad day right there. Shipwreck and cold water. Okay. Now, Paul being the good dude he is, he's going to help gather some wood for the fire, right? So he gathered bundled of six, laid them on the fire, and a viper comes out because of the heat, warmed him up, and latched onto his hand. <laughs> Golly. Shipwreck, cold, probably has no energy. Guys, let me, let me pull my weight. Let me get some firewood. Here you go. Ch -ch -ha -ha. Oh, my goodness. The day just got better, didn't it? Bless his heart. Well, he's been talking about hardship, hadn't he? Okay, watch this. Now, you think about you when things are going hard and it gets even harder. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, <laughs> they said to one another, there's no doubt this man must be a murderer. How many times have we seen that with somebody's life, we think, they're going through so much stuff, they did, they had to do something wrong. <laughs> That's what they're saying. No doubt this man's a murderer. He escaped the sea, but now God got him. Yet justice does not allow him to live. Like, he's he about to die, right? He, I mean, it's one of them snakes. I don't, you know, one of them that's, that's poisonous, right? But Paul shook the creature off in the fire and suffered no harm. Now, watch this. Isn't this like our friends, our so-called friends? Something bad happens. They, they, they talking. Yeah. They were expecting that he would swell up. And suddenly fall down dead. They was ready for that, right? But what did they say? After they had looked for a long time. Don't you know they was just sitting there. Paul's over there. Paul knew he was all right. They was look. You, you turning green yet? Hey, man, you all right? <laughs> you dizzy? <laughs> How you feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds, and then they said that he was a god. Now, that translation right there, go look it up and study it. In other words, he's of God. That changes everything. Okay, I want you to think about that. We, we shake off hardship and we give God glory for what he does through it because it humbles us, right? It humbles us. And we see his strength in our life through the hardship. It's just like, it's just like uh, Paul. Bad, bad situation. Shipwreck, cold. Now, Poisoned the snake on him. But he was okay. He was okay. So here, here's what we can learn from that. If there wasn't hardship in our life, then we would tend to exalt ourselves because everything's always good. Okay? We need, you, when you see hardship come, you could, you could almost, and it's weird to say, man, I really needed that to, to bring me back and to humility. Because it's only in the humility that we're going to be exalted. As long as everything's going good, and listen, we need seasons of things going good because we need to recuperate, and we, we, there's times of blessing and thankfulness, absolutely. I mean, God, God said he wants us to have life and life to the full. He wants us to enjoy creation and, and enjoy one another, and you know what I'm saying. I ain't saying it all should be doom and gloom, but if it's, need, if it's always doom and gloom for you, it may be because you need to be humbled all the time. He may knew if you got some things and you got ahead or whatever, you're going to exalt yourself and leave him. 
So you wonder why people, people, a lot of people, it seems like there's hardship all the time. That may be a blessing to them. This, this, this ain't easy. And y'all may throw rocks at me. But isn't that what the Word just said? That's heavy. But here's the whole deal. Whatever it takes to keep us off the throne is what we need. I, 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 that should be our prayer right there, Lord. Whatever it takes to keep me off the throne, let it happen. I don't want to be my own distraction. Because ultimately, the devil's going, yeah. I want to redirect worship off of God onto you. And he's just going. Because he knows exactly what happened to him. He exalted himself and he was humbled. Kicked out. And he knows that if a child of God can be kicked out. In other words, tail tore up. He would love to see that. If God's heart was hurt because of what we did, oh, he would love that. If we, if we made Jesus' name look bad, he would love that. And we make Jesus' name look bad when we put ourselves above him. So, don't be a distraction to yourself any longer. That's my word. That's my message today. God is good all the time. All the time. I love you guys. I'm so thankful y'all come on Wednesdays. It's hard. I know it's hard. But it's, it, you think about what you're doing. You're humbling yourself by coming because you want to you wanna hear the word of God. Of course it'd be easy to go home, kick back in the easy chair, right? It's just some sweet, some sweet tea and just say, oh, yeah, Mr. Remote, come here. <laughs> right? And you need to do that at some point. You don't, can't wear yourself out. But, man, when we got the word open up here. Come feed. Come feed, because I guarantee you, you'll feel a lot better now that you go get in the easy chair, get you a shower or whatever, sit down, you'll, be, you, you, you'll have a peace about you because you just got fed the Word of God. All glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. Let's pray, and, and, and y'all can go get in your easy chair if that's what you're going to do. Some of you may have to go back to work. I don't know. Whatever it is, stay humble. Stay humble. Amen. <laughs> James, you want to lead us, brother? Yes, All right.